I'm going to introduce the, uh, the panel briefly. We're going to go more or less in the order that we're sitting, except that David Ferriero, who is the Archivist of the United States, will go first. You all have programs. The programs speak briefly to the accomplishments and virtues uh, of the members of our panel, the, so I'm not going to repeat very much of it. The basic setup is that I've given each of my colleagues 10 minutes, um, uh, whereupon I will be ruthless. Um, and um, that will leave then about 20 minutes or maybe a little more. Each of them, by the way, has assured me that he will use nothing like 10 minutes. So you can, you can monitor that. Um, um, and then we will have an open discussion uh, of the issues. The, the question of the role of getting, uh, obviously, government documents and government data as part of the DPLA is, I think, one that is uh, energizing and exciting. But I'll do more, no more editorializing for the moment. It's my pleasure now to introduce David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, uh, long time, wonderful and valuable career in libraries, one of the few people in the business that everybody both likes and respects. And with that, David. Good afternoon, sorry I'm not with you. Um, Brewster, congratulations on that church. That was my first view of it. Um, I can just see you in the pulpit there. Nice to see it finally. Can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> good. Uh, let me start by just reminding folks that um, I have, as, as Paul said, I have been in libraries for a long time. So my entire career has been spent trying to connect people with the information that they need. I was attracted to, um, to Washington, to the National Archives, because of... Uh, the Open Government initi Initiative in this administration, which is trying to create a, 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 a climate of transparency, participation, and collaboration. And that translates, for me, into figuring out ways of getting my records, uh, which at this point uh, we estimate at around 12 billion pieces of paper, not, not to even mention the electronic content, but to get as much of that content um, into uh, the eyes of, of the American public uh, in any way that I can. So the DPLA, my interest in the DPLA began when, when um, Bob Darton started talking about it uh, when I was at the New York Public Library. When, as a trustee of the New York Public Library, and he got very interested in creating something like um, a massive uh, digital library that had the content of the American culture. And I got very interested at that point, and so my interest has been sustained and peaked as I've taken on my responsibilities at the National Archives. It's an opportunity for government players, not only the National Archives, but the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, the National Agricultural Library, all of us, the GPO, and to, to um, don't forget the Federal Register, which is part of the National Archives, to collaborate in a way that we have never collaborated before to ensure that the American public has access to all of this wonderful information. I see in terms of um, uh, the, if this is, if we play our cards right, that we have an opportunity through the DPLA to actually change government. We have an opportunity to, to create a, a common portal that gives the American people access to the actions of their government for the first time a better informed citizenry, more transparency, but most importantly, more citizen engagement in the government process. And that's something that, that this administration has committed itself to, and we have the opportunity to actually concretely support that, that initiative through this work. And that's the reason that I am um, so so passionate about this and so excited about it. Now we've had a couple of really good, what I would call demonstration projects, um, some glimpses of what that might look like thanks to the work of my friend Carl Malamud who has 
in the two and a half years that I have been the National Archives has been pushing us in directions that we probably never would have taken if we didn't have his support. But it's a good example of the citizen engagement in making con government content um, recognizable and usable by, by the world, actually. So I'm um, higher than a kite about this, and um, as I promised Paul, I'm not going to take 10 minutes. I'm more interested in the conversation that we can have as a group. So I'm um, going to turn it over to Carl. Okay. Um, so next up is, uh, is Mark Sandler, who um, runs the Cooperative Library Project, which isn't exactly what it's called, at the, uh, at the CIC, and therefore I have to pay close attention to everything that, uh, that he says. He's also been in the library business for quite some time. Mark? That I have, uh, and Paul's a paying member, so I'm gonna be careful here. So. And uh, I, I can't do what David just did. I don't think I can do a, a five-minute talk without moving my lips. I was watching carefully there. And it was, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was a pretty, pretty good trick there. Um, I'm using uh, traditional PowerPoint, and I snuck this slide in here. It's, a, it's really just a, a little, um, like a Google ad for the CIC universities <laughs> that sort of ranked high on my slide stack. Uh, just because I was rigging the algorithm here. But this is just a, a reminder to you all about um, what or, or who uh, the CIC um, is, a group of uh, 13 universities uh, conveniently and pleasantly located in the Midwest. Um, the CIC actually stands for something, but I'm not going to tell you what that is because a friend of ours wrote an article. He described it as the grimly named Committee on Institutional Cooperation. So. So anyway, that's, uh, that's uh, who we are and where we are. And the, um, the library directors of the CIC um, universities uh, have actually uh, agreed to put their um, collective uh, shoulders to the wheel to um, try to digitize as much of the um, Federal Depository Library Project um, uh, um, collection as possible, those resources that have been distributed by um, GPO since um, uh, somewhere back uh, in 1813 in some cases, and then, uh, you know, sort of a revamped effort in 1895, and then revamped again in the early 1960s, so gone through several iterations, but um, the, the really primary distribution system that government has developed in partnership with libraries to make government information broadly accessible to the, um, to the uh, citizens of the, of the U.S. So um, we have uh, sort of set out to um, do as much uh, digitizing of this legacy collection as possible, working in partnership with Google and the fruits and results of that digitization being deposited in the Hathi Trust um, Digital Library. Um, the numbers involved, uh, and uh, I don't want to bore you with this, and it's not whatever David said, 12 billion or something like that, that he was looking at. So this is small potatoes by contrast. Um, but uh, to date, we've done about 250,000 volumes that, are, um, that have been uh, digitized, scanned, and uh, ingested into Hathi Trust, and those are um, accessible uh, now to the public. Um, there's about another 250,000 or so that are cataloged, processed, barcoded, and ready to go. In other words, they're in queue for scanning at a point where we can um, develop enough uh, capacity or throughput through Google or other scanning possible uh, partners as possible to get that material out of the way. Um, beyond that 500,000, things get a little uh, dicier. There's something like 762,000 um, records in OCLC for unique government document titles held by one or another CIC university. Um, some of those are available to us for scanning, some of them not so available to us for scanning. So um, 500,000 I think we can do, 762 gets a little more difficult, not impossible. And then there's a mysterious number, it's amazing how little we know about this corpus, 
given that we're sitting on this 1,200 times over across the country, um, we don't know probably within a half a million, um, you know, about the overall size of this collection or what libraries are holding and, um, and how uh, easy or difficult it'll be to get them catalog processed uh, digitized and ultimately um, accessible. So um, overall, um, you know, we've seen numbers like 1.5 million print volumes, 2, 2 million, 2.2 million, um, some guesses up to 3 million, but it's a little dicey because we're trying to strip out microform, uh, microfiche copies, we're trying to strip out maps, we're trying to strip out CD-ROMs and other formats at this point. Um, the work that's currently going on, scanning, um, is going on and continues to go on, although not at, at the robust pace that we would like or most of you would like to see. Um, cataloging, uh, projects going on, University of Minnesota doing fast track cataloging of some 100,000 or more of documents that had never been cataloged. Purdue University working with the University of Iowa to catalog the serial set at the item level. Um, Penn State University uh, dedicated a cataloger to doing Department of Commerce work. So a lot of that slog work and it's always, you know, you come here and you look out and you go, oh my God, there's young people here, how fabulous. And not only that, they're bright and they have vision and they're doing exciting things. And I got to admit, the work that we're doing is kind of like schlepper work, you know, where it's a <laughs> slog. It's a, you know, we're, it, it's really, we're trying to, I guess, uh, sort of create the landfill that uh, DPLA and others can come in and build some, you know, fabulous uh, planned community on, or Disney World with all sorts of uh, exciting rides and colorful uh, uh, architectural statements and, uh, you know, whatever. So, um, so you know, there is uh, not a, a big punchline um, to the work going on in the CIC. But um, it is a substantial um, number of volumes, and ultimately, we do believe it will be um, significant, um, a significant improvement for users, both in terms of, of providing them with convenient access, giving them opportunity to do different kinds of work than they were ever able to do um, in the print world. It will certainly improve discoverability, which has always been a challenge in the documents world. Um, uh, we think it'll be a big help to libraries in terms of uh, allowing them to, to do a better job of managing their resources and, um, and preserving uh, content with which uh, they've been entrusted. And ultimately, we do um, believe it will um, allow for some efficiencies uh, in government and in government's relationship to the citizens of, of the country. Um, that it will, uh, as David said, it will foster engagement around this content. Um, it will give people more of an opportunity to interact with it. Now, our attention is primarily, primarily on legacy materials, and overwhelmingly we assume that most people are most engaged most of the time with current content. And that opens up all sorts of questions about born digital, um, uh, information that government, that GPO um, has available and how they distribute it, how they make it accessible and how we integrate that with the legacy collection that um, our libraries and others are trying to help um, um, develop. So, um, you know, that, that's an interesting question. I think the, the whole um, just question about, well, you know, what is this information anyway and how valuable is it in the absence of analysis, in the absence of context, without historical uh, context or, um, or, or uh, an, an opportunity to view it, you know, and where, where do you sort of draw the line between um, the purposes of government and, the, um, and our interest in creating that informed citizenry? And I guess the faith that we would all like to have that government shares that interest in having a truly informed citizenry, but uh, uh, certainly not every, every document that government uh, chooses to publish and share is really aimed at that purpose of information. Um, there are lots of other reasons why government um, uh, decides to talk to people or at people. Um, so, uh, 
uh, we don't want to turn this into an occupy, um, <laughs> occupy the internet archive meeting, but um, you know, <laughs> someone could certainly step back and say, um, what has to be done with this information to put it in a context that really does um, uh, um, add to the public dialogue and create a true body of information as opposed to uh, just an onslaught of uh, disinformation, propaganda, um, marketing pieces for various government agencies, etc. So uh, I'm going to uh, um, get down. I don't know how my time went there. Paul, how did I do? So, you got a whole minute left to go. Okay. Well, I'll take this with me, I think. Well, since Mark isn't going to take his minute, I am. Uh, I'm, since I'm in a church here, and thank you, Brewster, for making the church available to us, uh, I'm going to say that in answer to Mark's fairly dystopic questions of a moment ago, um, I would say that one thing that's required in order to put this work into context and make sense of it is to have it. Uh, and that is a strong argument for, um, for digitizing and making broadly available uh, the record of the United States government, whatever the government might have thought it was up to, we're much more likely to find out what it was up to if we can find out what it said. Um, uh, and uh, that's actually a very good note on which to introduce Carl Malmud, who's been saying similar things in many contexts um, for, um, for some time. Carl? Carl is, by the way, the president of publicresources.org, um, and that's it. Carl, go. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Mark, congratulations for doing that GPO work. Um, that is actually, there's been, I, I would not say opposition from the government printing office, but certainly stonewalling. And so the fact that CIC has gone forward with that, I think, is a real testament to what they're doing. Um, there's arisen a bright line between government and the rest of our country. It's a line, or you might call it a wall, or a ditch, or a moat, or an ocean. And it's a feeling that government is only relevant to those inside the beltway. Uh, the feeling is that government is only relevant to lobbyists from large uh, interests with offices on K Street or only relevant to government bureaucrats and that's somehow not a part of our country and not in touch with the rest of us. And I think that rhetoric is wrong. There's also a bright light that's arisen between the capabilities of our government and those of the pri private sector. It's a bright line that has led to a reliance on private contractors to do the real work of government to an outsourcing of democracy to some spectacularly bad deals. Take the Government Accountability Office. They maintain a legislative history of every law. They packed those 50 million pages of paper and they sent them at government expense to the Thompson Corporation, which digitized them and turned them into a product. Thompson sent those valuable papers back to the government. Now, what did the government get for their consideration? They got a couple logins from a couple staffers, but even members of Congress must now pay to access this Thompson product. This is based on a perception that government can only spend money and it must rely on profiteers to do the real work of government. And that rhetoric is also wrong. Uh, the question I think that's before us today is whether government is relevant to a digital public library of America, whether the works of government are relevant to Americans, whether we can jump that wall and whether we should jump that wall. Take the regulations that are promulgated by our executive branch, the edicts of government. This is the code of regulations. It's 170,000 pages of dense text. The regulations of our 50 states are another million pages or so. Now these are rules that are relevant to every person. These are the OSHA safety regulations that every business owner or every factory worker must obey. These are the hazmat storage and transport regulations. These are the product safety regulations for hearing aids and baby strollers and propane tanks and elevators. Are these edicts of government available to citizens to afford themselves? Are they available for publishers that wish to make them more readable? Are they available for the businesses that must obey them? Are they available to students that wish to learn? At the state level, Stanford University and the American Association of Law Libraries did a national inventory of legal materials they found that the regulations of the 50 states are a paragon of unusability, an abomination of bad HTML, and <laughs> atrocious graphics. 
they found that 26 states assert copyright and prohibit reuse of their regulations. <laughs> At the federal level, the Federal Register, the official newspaper of government, is only available going back a few years, although kudos are absolutely due to Mr. Ferriero for the amazing transformation he's made in that publication since he took office. The Code of Federal Regulations, the codifications of our rules, is only available in very bad, unformatted text, or even worse, SGML, a technology that became old in the 1970s. <laughs> now, there is an XML version of the code that was created by Cornell with considerable cooperation from the government printing office. But those parties agreed that the XML would not be made available to any outside party so Cornell could monetize their investment, making money on this valuable part of the public domain. The theory is government has no choice because why would anyone want to make government better unless they can make a profit? That rhetoric is also wrong. It hurts democracy and government should not condone this and I don't think the American people should. There's one more consideration. The CFR is 170,000 pages, but that's only the visible part. There are many tens of thousands of pages that are incorporated by reference. They're made part of the official law of the land, but only available by paying money to private parties. We're not talking about trivial amounts of money. A mandatory safety standard from underwriters laboratories costs $850 to purchase. A four-page document about how one must test for lead paint costs $64. The IEEE Dictionary of Electronic Terms costs $500, and that vocabulary forms the basis for many government procurement actions. Much of the CFR is hidden behind a cash register, and it's a poll tax on access to justice. You can't read our fuel and gas code, or our life safety fire code, or the firework safety standards, or the water hygiene guidelines without an American Express card. And I brought samples for you. I have spent about $30,000 on some of these privately produced standards. And by the way, they're produced by nonprofits, by 501c3 nonprofits. And many of them pay their CEOs a million dollars. Underwriters Labs pays $2.2 million to their CEO. And so if you want to make the law available and read it, you would need to spend $60 for the safety requirements for window cleaning. You'd have to spend $72 for the standard for disinfecting water mains. You'd have to spend $217 for the safety requirements for wheeled child conveyances from the British Standards Institute. The American National Standard for Power Operated Pedestrian Doors is $40. The performance requirement for hot water dispensers and household storage types is $45. The performance requirements for pressurized flushing devices known as flushometers for plumbing fixtures is $45. The um, American Petroleum Institute for the Welding of Pipeline and Related Facilities, and if you care about oil spills, you care about this, $125. By the way, these are shrink wrap. They have a license agreement that by tearing this cellophane, you agree you will not take this and do anything with it, include giving a copy to somebody else. Even giving this copy that you purchased, you give away your right of first sale. The standard for the disinfection of wells is $72. And my favorite, the standard for the construction and approval for the transportation of fireworks, novelties, and theatrical pyrotechnics, which you would think would matter a little bit on Independence Day, is $60. <laughs> These regulations are one small part of the information in our government storehouses. Genealogy, the law, economy, science, the arts, all this information is relevant to people in their day-to-day -day lives. This is useful information. It's vital to education. Just imagine if law students could see video of Lawrence Tribe arguing before the Supreme Court. If engineering students could not only read the technical safety standards, and these standards are not in the libraries because they cost too much, but what if they could read them and make them better? Government information is useful to people, but the reverse is true. People and institutions like a Digital Public Library of America can help government make information available to avoid bad partnerships, to find problems like privacy violations in documents. People can make government better because we are the government and an informed citizenry is not just a desirable attribute to democracy, 
it's a prerequisite. John Adams made that point so eloquently when he said that if we believe that truth, liberty, justice, and benevolence are the everlasting basis of law and government, then we must arm our citizens with knowledge. This right to bear knowledge is far more important than the Second Amendment. Government information shouldn't be a concealed carry privilege for the rich. The knowledge lobby should be more powerful than the gun lobby. John Adams, John Adams said that we must let the public disputations become researches into the grounds and nature and ends of government. We must spread far and wide the ideas and sensations of freedom. He said we must let every sluice of knowledge be opened and set aflowing. That is our job as citizens. That's our government's job. That's our society's responsibility for democracy. And that, I put to you, is the opportunity for a digital public library of America. Thank you. You have energized the citizenry. <laughs> nice move. Um, our last speaker is Abi Namani, who is Director of Strategy and Communications at Code for America and who's been working on transparency in local government. Abi, you're up. I'm not sure how I can top that, though. So uh, <laughs> set expectations really low right now. I don't even have props, so sorry. Um, well, I wanted to start with an admission. Um, so I, I spent some time in Oxford studying, and as you all here probably know, they have some of the greatest, most magnificent, most historic libraries in the world. Um, but here's the thing, it's actually really cold there, and so I didn't go to any of them. <laughs> uh, with my time there, I actually spent most of my time doing my research online. So I'm really thrilled about this idea of a digital public library. Um, for some context, I work with a company called Code for America. Um, what we do is we're kind of like a Peace Corps for geeks. Um, we give the technical talent, some of the great people who work in this city, for instance, who've changed our private world, give them an avenue to use their skills, their talent, their passion. Give them a way to use that for public service. And, uh, and Carl asked me to come here because we focus on cities. And unlike the other guys here, I'm supposed to remind you that cities matter. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about local government, about the data there, and how that, I think, is really important for the digital public library. I was also told that some of the context for this conversation was, imagine 10 years from now, and you have the ideal cities, you have the ideal government with all the data available as possible, and you have a digital public library. What does that look like? What does it look like 10 years from now? So I thought I'd give a little bit of a sense of what we're seeing and how we see that might inform 10 years from now. But I thought I'd start with yesterday. So one of our cities that we're working with is the city of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia's actually been setting the bar high for openness and for an engaging city. And just yesterday, their mayor passed an executive order for openness, that everything that the city does now has to be open, that they have to have a data catalog that catalogs all that information, that they have to have a chief digital officer and a chief data officer, and an assembly board of citizens, corporations, and government officials all collaborating on the standards and the way that data should work. Think about that, right? government and citizen collaboration and a commitment to openness coming from a mayor. And I think that's just the start. <laughs> I'm sad that you guys are laughing. <laughs> but I think that's just the start. We're seeing this happen city after city. So th using that framework, I think 10 years from now, if, if we do our job well, if other people in this space do their jobs well, you're going to have this amazing opportunity. You're going to have this opportunity where you're having cities and states and hopefully the federal government, if the archivist does his job, um, having all of their data out there and open. So the question then for the digital public library is, what are the services, what are the benefits that that kind of institution can provide? And I think it's three things. I think it's standards, I think it's context, and I think it's collaboration. So let me talk a little bit about those one at a time. So uh, standards. So let me tell you about an app that we built last year. Um, this was in the city of Boston. Um, so the way that our program works is we send a group of fellows out in the city, they talk to anybody that'll give them time. And based on that research, they decide what apps to build. And one of our fellows was talking to a fireman, asking, hey, what's a pain point in your job? What's something that you wish was done differently? And he said, well, it snows a lot here in Boston, and these hydrants that we have get covered with snow. And every time there's a snowstorm, they have to go out there, firemen, and start shoveling these things out. And you can imagine how much of a burden that is, and you can imagine how much 
Better it would be if they were spending, out their, spending their time, say, putting out fires. So this guy did what any good web developer would do. He built an app. <laughs> so he built adoptahydrant.com, which is just a simple way for citizens to say, like, hey, that hydrant's right in front of my house. And I want firemen to be able to come into my house quickly if there's a fire. And he was able, and people can adopt them. And it's great. Like, the, the hydrants jump up and down, and you adopt them. You can give them a name. <laughs> it's, it's a nice little application. But how was that application possible? Because the government had the data they could give our developer of where the hydrants are. But here's what's even cooler about that application. Um, a couple months later, we had a conference. We brought together all of our city partners and our future partners. And this year, we're working with the city of Honolulu. And uh, the representative from Honolulu, a guy named Forrest, comes up and he's like, hey guys, I love that app, Adopt a Hydrant. We're using it in Honolulu. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Forrest, we don't think it snows there. We're happy for you, but uh, what are people going to do? But he said they have storm sirens. And when there's, tsunami, when, there's, when there's strong weather, those sirens help people near the coast be prepared and leave. But those sirens are powered by batteries. And people tend to steal those batteries so they don't work. So they're rolling out Adopt a Siren. So what I think is powerful here, and, and I think the opportunity for a digital public library is, what if data about each piece of civic infrastructure was cataloged? And what if turning on Adopt a Hydrant was just as easy as clicking play or pressing go on a WordPress.com site? And once a library or an institution can catalog all of that civic information, can pinpoint where that civic infrastructure is, there's a really exciting opportunity for building interesting and useful applications that change the way the government work. So I think that's the first opportunity, is providing standards. Um, and then I think the second opportunity is providing context. And this is going to run a little bit afoul of what I actually just said, so sorry. But um, this is another application that we were building in Boston. It was called Discover BPS. The, so for some context, um, the city was getting a lot of, a lot of political pressure. Because when parents want to go choose the schools that their students want to go to, they were handed this 35-page PDF, not unlike, I'm sure, the documents Carl just showed you, <laughs> that no one could read even if they wanted to. And parents got understandably pretty upset about this. And the Boston Globe ran an expose criticizing the, the school, this, the city. So the city came to us and they said, hey, can you help us with this? And so our developer is like, all right, we'll give it a shot. So we got the data about where the schools are and built an app, Discover BPS. It's like Yelp, right, but for schools. Great. And the schools use a thing that's like, you can go to a school within two miles of where your home is, right? Um, but the problem with that data is that sometimes that two miles is just landlocked, right? You can walk there. But sometimes that two miles has a river in between it or the ocean. So <laughs> it's challenging for that app to say that school's actually in your walk zone. And so where's the, op the opportunity here then is for libraries, for people, local people, to provide context around what that, I think this stopped working. Hello? You guys, no? I can try speaking loudly. Can you hear me like Hello? Hello? Okay, there we go. Thanks. Sorry about that. So I <laughs> Okay, let's try that for a little while, and then when that stops working, I'll just start shouting. Um, but that's the kind of context that you need people, and that you need people who are local to provide, to say, actually, that school district is within the walk zone because you can walk there quickly, because you can get there. And I think as you build an institution, as you build the DPLA, you need to create situations. I think now they both are on. OK. Uh, you need to think about how you construct it in a way where people can provide that feedback, can make the data even better. And then finally, I'll say there's an opportunity for collaboration. So when I was growing up, the only time I'd really go to the library was during the summer because they had a fishing class. You could go to the library and get a, a fishing pole, and they would teach you how to fish. You'd meet other kids, and you'd go out and fish. Right? So there's a, there's a powerful thing there, I think. There's an interesting opportunity where you're bringing people together. The library is doing that. And I think it's interesting in that it's distinct from government, right? Because so we run into this problem where the government provides data. It's not always complete. How do you make that data better? And how do you verify that that data is right? And we've seen, and frankly, for a good reason, a lot of hesitation from the governments to take citizen-provided data, right? There's a hydrant here. Well, what if there's not? and then the fire department goes out there to put out a fire. That's somewhat dangerous. But I think that's an interesting role intermediaries can play, particularly libraries, and particularly a, a digital library, of saying, we can take that data, bring people together, 
and provide services on top of it. And I think there's an amazing role here in civic life that the DPLA can play in that pr promoting activity on top of that data. So in February, we have this program called the Brigade, which is a way to get local citizens engaged in making their cities better themselves, not just our fellows. And we host a set of hackathons. Hackathons, if you don't know, are ways that people come together and spend a day building technology. And so we thought, what if we could get a dozen plus cities doing this at the same time on the same day and getting them working together? And so we did this in February. We called it Code Across America. And we had 16 cities doing this on the same. This is really fun. <laughs> we had 16 cities doing this together on the same day. And what if the DPLA had a hackathon where they had these people doing this everywhere on the standards with the context they needed? I think the opportunity there is immense. And we're just starting to unlock some of that potential. So in closing, what I'll say is, what we're seeing a lot of is a transition of government from the role of saying just providing a service, but instead becoming more of a platform providing information, right? And then letting other people take advantage of that information. It's government becoming, moving from, if you think about network theory, from the key piece of the node as moving as just one piece of it, right? The key element of a node to just one piece of a broader network. And if you can, ima <laughs> if you can imagine the DPLA fully fleshed out with great data, with people taking advantage of it, I think you can see a role where the DPLA is playing a governance role, where it's playing a role where it's providing services to the citizens that government was conceived to provide itself. And I think that's really exciting, and we're excited to see where that goes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, are you still with us? David may or may not still be with us. Yes, yes, there yes. There you are, good. Um, so I think we're open for questions now. Just remember that the Archivist of the United States is on the other end of a phone, and if you ask him a question, he'll probably answer it. Questions, comments? Really? I have one. Good. Uh, it's it's for Mark. Mark, on one of your slides, you um, there was a um, kind of a question about funding and the government. Um, I interpreted it as a um, suspicion that the government isn't going to step up to this. Speaking for my friend Mark, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I do think for um, universities or the DPLA or other centers sort of playing in the sandbox, there is that, that always that question about um, should GPO be doing this, should we defer to Library of Congress, is NARIG just going to do this and do it better than we ever could and, um, and, and have create a more authoritative, uh, official um, corpus of uh, U.S. federal publications. And, uh, you know, David, I, I'd love to push this question back to you, is what you think that um, the potential, either the politics or the, the economics of that look like in D.C. In, in this day and age? Well, this day and age um, is uh, a little bit iffy um, and will be until elections. But um, I can tell you that the mood in Washington, the mood on the Hill, and this, this will not change, um, is very much in favor of public-private partnerships. And, I, and coupled with um, a, 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 an emphasis on the K-12 through community. And I think um, I'm confident that if we market this DPLA correctly, that we're going to be very successful on the Hill and in the White House in attracting support because of those two factors, the public-private and the K-12 through link. Can I ask a brief question? If CIC wanted to give a copy of those 250,000 volumes they've already scanned to the government, should they just send them to the National Archives? Is that a no? Mr. Ferriel? Oh, are you asking me? Absolutely. You're the only government official in the room. <laughs> Isn't Susan Hildreth there? <laughs> she had to leave. <laughs> I'd be happy to entertain such a uh, request. 
I'll pay for the disk drives. <laughs> we have volunteers here, David. <laughs> Great. Is there a question? I thought I saw one. There we go. That's probably one of the few government documents librarians here today. My name is Kate Wingerson. I'm at SFPL. One of the things that concerns me on two sides, well, gives me faith on one side and concerns me on the other, is the decertification that so many libraries are going through in the depository program. One, I'm concerned that this is, the digitization is going to give plenty of administrators plenty more excuses to decertify um, depository libraries. But it also gives me faith that at least while these libraries are decertifying and um, parceling out their collections, that we're going to see them hopefully, you know, digitized at some point and still have access locally to those collections. So how do we balance that so that we're not seeing more decertification and less access to the physical uh, copies themselves? Uh, well, I'm not an expert in this area, but I, I do believe that the question of the Federal Depository Library programs, which I believe were created in 1964, the current program, is really ripe for a little bit of modernization and thinking about the program. It costs a million dollars a year to be a Federal Depository Library, and, and many places simply just don't have that extra million dollars. Uh, particularly given um, what appear to be some very outmoded practices in the government printing office and a resistance to looking at creative solutions. And so I, I think it's important that GPO maybe step up to the plate and help these libraries either stay in business or figure out how to get some of this digitization to happen. And so far there's a big impasse. Um, there's actually a, a whole set of letters going back and forth between the government printing office and, and various state librarians. And it's a pretty ugly situation right now, and that probably needs to change. I, I guess I'll just add to that, for, for those of you who don't uh, follow the inside baseball of the government documents uh, community or didn't aspire to be government documents librarians your entire life, um, there are uh, 1,200. Um, depositories across the country and you know at a, at, at a point in time when something on the order I think of 96 percent now of government publications are made available digitally right upon publication as well as in print um, there is, is certainly a concern that that 1200 may not be the right number um, so I you know I and the word decertified is a little you know I, I just think it's a Right, a, a slow um, molting or <laughs> shedding of, of uh, depository libraries. Every year, uh, a few more sort of um, uh, just can no longer shoulder the burden and, and drop out of the programs. It's not so much that they're decertified as that they're just exhausted. David, uh, Stephen Abram, uh, is there any consideration in uh, NARA or the uh, U.S. government to follow the Canadian model that was announced two weeks ago to go 100% digital for all documents going forward. Today we've been talking about retrospective conversion but moving forward and then is there uh, consideration around the principles of uh, locks and keeping things safe to avoid having a central repository that could have rogue employees making abortion a stop word or uh, changing all the words for global warming to climate change internally to documents. So how do we make sure that the, co the original copy is safe and is there any consideration of uh, digital only publishing to ensure that there is a, a widely available archive? So um, the president issued a um, historic memorandum at the end of November on um, records management. It's the first time since the Truman administration that the White House has gotten involved in records management. And it basically um, uh, requires every agency to do th three things. Um, to uh, name a senior officer, not the records manager, a senior officer in the agency who has responsibility for records management. It requires them, each agency, to submit a report to me and the Office of Management and Budget that spells out what the barriers, obstacles are to going digital. And the final piece of it is that I, working with OMB,
create a plan for the government to go all digital. So there is um, a lot of a lot of um, investigation work going on right now. We've we've gone through the first two phases of the mandate in this memorandum, and we will be issuing a report in August. We've got about 750 suggestions from the 250 agencies about um, what's what's what the obstacles are and what some of the solutions are. So I'm. I'm optimistic we're going to have a plan. It will probably require changes in the Federal Records Act, which um, hasn't acknowledged, if you can believe it, in 2012, hasn't acknowledged electronic records. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to have progress. The Canadian, I'm, uh, Danielle Caron, who is the, you know, my counterpart in Canada, is a good friend. So this um, mandate, um, in Canada, it was actually announced about three years ago, just before I arrived, um, and it has been um, there's been a great deal of controversy in Canada, and I'm watching it closely to see how this is going to uh, play out. Um, I guess that's all I'll say on, on that front. Um, on the, the locks, uh, long-term access, security, authenticity, uh, guaranteeing authenticity of the records. We have um, one of the things I inherited when I became the archivist was a, uh, a project known as Electronic Records Archive, um, a partnership with Lockheed Martin to create a uh, facility that would um, ingest electronic records being created by all the federal agencies by the White House in a separate instance and congressional records also. So three different kind of instances of electronic records archiving. Um, Long-term preservation is the, the, um, the design feature of this. Migra uh, translating and migrating um, records over time uh, to ensure that they're available in perpetuity. Um, identification of um, uh, dated, outdated um, uh, means of uh, creation of records, kind of a hit list of um, those records, electronic records, at at risk, at highest risk, and we've um, just completed some work on our EBCDIC files. You, most people. Probably never even heard of EBSTDIC, but it's a language that IBM used. NASA used it quite extensively during the 60s. Um, we've um, been able to create translation programs that will enable us to migrate those those records over time. So there's a, um, a fair amount of thinking and work going on, not only just at NARA, but with our international partners on this front. Coming. Hi, David. It's Julia Young from Mississippi. How are you? How are you? I'm great. How are you? Super. We're sorry you're not here. I Me just too. would encourage DPLA to save place for born digital records from the very start because here, all here. of the government records are born digital these days. And it's not just publications, it's, you know, Haley Barber's email about pardons. Um, so we need to have public access to that information from the get-go. Couldn't agree with you more. So this is mostly a question for Carl. They, um, well, I think for every issue of scholarly communication. I work with you. Um, yes, I've had a series of conversations with the uh, what are known as SDO standards development organizations. The, the vast majority of them are 501c3 nonprofits. Many are extremely distinguished engineering bodies. The National Fire Protection Association uh, does an amazing job of fire safety standards. 
and their big question, um, and I've, I've gotten this for 20 years as I try to put things online, it's like, well, okay, but who's going to pay for this? Um, what are we going to do to make up for the money that we lose? Now, there, there's a couple answers to that. Um, if the standards that have been incorporated by reference um, into law are made available for reuse, as we believe our Constitution requires, um, we have to remember that's not all the standards they make. These bodies make many, many others. Uh, they intend for these standards to be made into law, and they are nonprofits, and so perhaps they have an obligation. Um, these are 40 to 50 million dollar a year operations in many cases. Underwriters Labs is 873 million dollars a year in revenue. Million dollar salaries, so maybe they could maybe, I don't know, look at their executive compensation. Um, they have a series of revenue streams, so rather than selling the standard, maybe they sell the annotated version of the standard. Maybe they charge for conferences and membership and training and certification and other things. And maybe the government hasn't taken um, its responsibility seriously enough so that when the government says, we're going to incorporate this standard by reference, they don't go to these bodies, or at least not officially, and say, we're going to pay you money, or they don't put it up for bid and say, gee, can we use this for free? And if we can't use this for free, maybe we'll use another standard. And many organizations, W3C, for example, gives away their standards because they feel it's part of their charter and their obligation. Um, so I've talked to these standards bodies. They think I'm being very unreasonable because they're, they've come to depend on these revenue streams. Um, I think they're going to have to change their business model. But you know what? We've all had to change our business models because of the internet. And this is one of the few industry segments that has not. And I think maybe they need to face up to the responsibilities. And I think the government, I think the Office of the Federal Register has an open comment period out right now as to whether they should change their policies. I know Cass Sunstein, an Office of Management and Budget, has raised this issue. I don't have a lot of hope that the White House is going to come down on the right side on this. But they're beginning to have that dialogue. Um, and I think they need to have it. But however, for the standards that have already been incorporated by reference, we believe that due process, equal protection, and a variety of other constitutional considerations, including decisions by the Fifth Circuit, means that we are free to go ahead and publish those. And we are in the process of purchasing and getting ready for publication uh, the vast majority of the technical standards in the Code of Federal Regulations. Yeah, over here. Uh, these are executive branch regulations, so the procedure is an agency says we wish to incorporate this by reference, and then the um, executive director of the Office of the Federal Register approves that incorporation. So this is executive branch incorporation. Well, so there's a very interesting question, and that actually has come up with people that have scanned the congressional record, and there is a worry. So what if you take a picture of Mickey Mouse, and as part of your testimony, you include it in the congressional, in your testimony? Um, does that information have copyright? Um, it is my position, and not everybody agrees with me, that the edicts of government, and this goes back to Wheaton v. Peters in 1824 and a whole series of decisions, um, that edicts of government have no copyright. Um, that doesn't mean you can take that picture of Mickey Mouse and sell it. Um, I believe that would be, and I'm not a lawyer, but I believe that would be a tort in which you are unfairly taking advantage of something. But I, don't, I do not believe that congressional record, congressional testimony, or any other executive branch, legislative, or judicial branch edicts of government have any copyright. And I believe those should be free for copying and for commercial reuse in, in many cases. You ought to be able to publish the annotated testimony to the Congress um, and make that a, a service at Bloomberg or whatever. But I'm not a lawyer. I play one on the internet, though. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to jump in and add, um, add to this, and I, I think Carl could um, probably gloss um, my comments because he, he's going to know a lot more about this. But there was uh, recently a report that came out of a government organization named CENDI, um, which is even more grimly named than the CIC, apparently. And I don't even know what CENDI stands for, if anything. 
but it's a cooperative interagency uh, group. And, um, and I think the, the estimates there were something on the order of 15% of government publication, um, as we think of it, has one or another degree of copyright protection. And yes, indeed, this is a very contentious issue for all of us as we look at it. And I'll jump in and say, um, you know, for those of you, well, who have been watching this, Google has been the primary scanning partner for the CIC. They have made very little of that information that they've scanned available through book search. Um, they have put up almost none of these government documents, certainly nothing beyond 1923 whereas Hathi Trust has been much more aggressive in, um, in taking that information and certifying that indeed it is a government publication because there's lots of things that our catalogers um, uh, incorrectly attribute as government publications, uh, you know, National Academy Press or, you know, almost anything with the word national in it. Or, um, it so uh, they are somewhat careful about uh, going through and trying to screen this and have criteria for looking, but have been much more aggressive in making that information available than um, Google is willing to be. But there is certainly contention around the copyright status of some categories of government publication. Um, so the federal government um, does not own copyright in materials. On the other hand, if you give something to the Smithsonian, if you give an Andy Warhol to the Smithsonian, they are able to hold copyrighted materials. So government could make a film and license a soundtrack, and that might have copyright, but the original productions of the government do not. Uh, there is a corollary to that. So states, for example, can hold copyright. But the corollary to that is that the law the law does not have copyright at any level. Edicts of government, municipal codes, state regulations, and I, I would submit to you congressional testimony and laws, uh, judicial opinions, and, as well as briefs submitted to courts. And there have been some lawyers that have, have maintained that their briefs are copyrighted and therefore you could not take and publish them and put them online in your library, let alone reuse them in your law firm. Um, that has not been litigated. If you read the law carefully, there is a strong presumption that the law must be available to everyone. Um, you know, it's ultimately up to a judge. And many of these issues simply haven't been litigated yet. So I want to make a point here. They're talking about two related but quite different things. Carl's talking about edicts of government and, you know, if the government's telling us to do something, there ought to be a way we could look it up, duh. And Mark is talking about more difficult cases where there may well be things in documents that the government has produced which, which are not copyrighted because the government produced them, but, the but stuff in the documents might well be which causes at least caution uh, on, in the way that we would use it. If you imagine the Digital Public Library of America going forward wanting to make um, available a, a great deal of the record of the United States government, well, care is definitely going to have to be taken there, but care taken is quite different from giving up on the project. Um, and I, for one, now being an immoderate moderator, would say we should not give up on the project. David, do you have any last comments for the, uh, for the group? I agree with what you said, um, and um, as one of the SENDI agencies, I'm going to actually look into this issue of 15% where they came from. So I'm taking that one on. Thank you for taking the time with us. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for making it to the end of the day. This is the last session on Next Steps. Um, Brewster, would you, this is your house. So would you like to say anything before I say just a few? No, you haven't. I've been the one on stage too much in your, in your house. Um, so I realize that uh, many of you would like to get out into the sunshine or go have a drink or do something else at the end of this day. And uh, thank you to all who have hung in there with the webcast as well. Um, this has been a wonderful, uh, energizing day, energizing two days, in fact, for those who have been at the work streams. I wanted just to say two things in closing. Um, the first is one big aggregated thank you. People have worked for many months to get to this point. The Harvard Law School uh, Innovation Lab team that's been doing the coding, uh, the SFPL team that's been doing the organizing of the work stream, a uh, whole variety of people at the Berkman Center, Urskasser, the executive director, and the entire team uh, have worked so hard. Um, today, I'm just struck by the great AV team that you have here, Brewster and the um, Heather and Nora, who have been the graphic artists. 
um, and in particular to you, Brewster, and your team. Let's have a big round of applause. Thank you. My big takeaway for the day is really just a sense of gratitude and momentum, these twin uh, notions. I think uh, at this moment we have a huge amount to be thankful for, which is a combination of a shared vision that's coming into play, uh, something that is marked by the soaring rhetoric of people like Bob Darnton, uh, like the archivist of the United States, like Susan Hildreth, like Carl Malamud, Luis Herrera. This is just an amazing set of uh, thinkers and people who are leading us forward. And thank goodness these are people in positions of leadership in this country. And also the great pragmatic can-do spirit of San Francisco and Silicon Valley and the sense of all of us uh, here trying to roll up our sleeves and figure out what to do. It is this combination that makes me hopeful uh, that this is going to come together uh, between now and April 2013 and, and much beyond uh, from there. Uh, in the work streams and today I have a sense that we have a lot of practical guidance in terms of where to go as a community. I know those of us working in the Secretariat and uh, coding away have much grist for the mill. Um, what you can look forward to in the coming months is much work toward another plenary in the fall and then of course the kickoff uh, a year from now and we're looking now for venues and homes for these events so if you have ideas please come forward as well as uh, suggestions for people uh, to be involved. Um, and I think what we can also see and look forward to um, is the growing of the community of people who are working on this. I am struck by the number of people who have come forward during these two days to offer help from uh, library students and hackers and coders and ordinary individuals seeking to get involved um, to booksellers and publishers who have offered uh, their help and engagement um, to libraries and lots of kinds of nodes, the Latino Digital Content Working Group that has come forward and said um, they are just getting off the ground at the same time and want to participate. Um, and ultimately, I think this is a story of uh, vision and practicality and a great deal of momentum. So I am buoyed by this event and want to say thank you to everyone who's here and everybody who is watching um, and to say we are concluded for this plenary session in the west coast of the DPLA and onward. Thank you so very much.